Good morning. I can see all your faces now. So I can tell who's nodding off or not. No, really, I can tell Ronnie's facial expressions better now. So um, it's good, good to be here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm glad you've taken the time this morning to assemble with God's people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. This being the first Sunday of the year, um, I think I would probably not cut it as a preacher if I did not preach on beginnings. So if you want to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we find one of the most profound statements in Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ten words. Gets the whole message across right in that first sentence. In fact, it, it's become, that first sentence is actually kind of a standard in the editing business. I have a book on editing because that's one of my weak spots. And the first rule of editing is uh, when it comes to your headline or when it comes to your writing, it says, keep it short and sweet to the point. God introduced his book in ten words. You can't do it better. Everything we need to know is said in those first ten words. And actually, in Genesis itself, Genesis itself is the book of beginnings, or a book of beginnings. We see so much in this book, and we're going to be looking at just a few of those this morning. But it's interesting enough that in this book of beginnings, that we find the answers to the four big questions that every person, whether consciously or unconsciously, has to answer in life. Every worldview has to account for these questions. They are, one, how do we get here? Two, what is the meaning of life? Three, how do we account for morals? And four, what is our destiny? Um, and we're going to see some of the comparisons today on that and why some other worldviews fall flat when it comes to answering, well, all of these. Um, so starting off with verse 1, we have the beginning of creation. Let's, let's go back to verse 1 and re let's read further. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning one day. And then God said, Let there be expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below, from the expanse, below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And it continues on with the six days of creation, and what God did in each and one of those days, and how he created, he spoke into existence. And in the first ten words, again, we are given the answer to the first question is, how did this all get here? It's interesting, too, that the, this first sentence as well serves as one of the best proofs or adds support for one of the best logical proofs for God's existence, which is the Kalam argument from about the 12th century. Uh, it, it's very short. In fact, the, the individual who came up with this or put it pen to paper said, every being which begins has a cause for its beginning. Now the world is a being which begins, therefore possesses a cause for its beginning. To kind of break that down, whatever begins to exist has a cause for it coming into existence. The universe we know exists, therefore the universe must have a cause for existence. And you have to figure out, every worldview has to account for this, what is the best explanation for how this all got here? Now, we're going to see something later on this, but the standard secular worldview, which normally has some common themes on it, normally there is some sort of varied degree of belief and some sort of evolutionary process, uh, some sort of event that started everything, such as the Big Bang or something else. But it's interesting that on the non-Christian worldview, what you have is if they were to write their own Bible, the beginning would say, in the beginning there was nothing. 
and then something happened to that nothing, and something came into existence because of that something. And then given enough time, that something evolved into everything we see today. And the funny thing is, from everything we know of observational science, none of that can be proven. Matter cannot be created. DNA does not magically just appear. In fact, the only thing that we've shown to actually happen with DNA, for example, is it degrades over time. Mutations are not because, of the, not because of new DNA being added somehow. Mutations are the result of the DNA chain degrading and breaking down. So we have that one. In the beginning there was nothing, then something, maybe, happened, and now we have everything. I'm kind of kicking myself right now because I just saw a really good illustration. I could have went to the store and got it. it, it basically, the evolutionary idea is I could take a Lego set, open the box, open all the bags, and pour the Lego set in the box. And I can just leave it. Let's sit there. And then, given enough time, it should assemble itself. Do you see how crazy that is? There's a specific design in that set, and it takes a person outside that set to affect and order it into its design. You look at the fine-tuning of the universe, how everything is perfectly ordered and how the laws operate the way they do. It can't happen by chance. And it's interesting too, thing, too, I read recently on the evolutionary standpoint, they said if the, natural, if the macro evolution, I, I need to make a distinction here real quick. There is a difference between macro evolution or large scale evolution, so molecules to man, and micro. Bible and we observe microevolution, if we want to call it that. Uh, mankind taming wolves and making them into the several different species of dogs we have today. That's change within a kind. That's change within a species. That has been observed. That can, be that can be tested. We've seen that. But the whole idea of starting out with a single cell organism and somehow over billions of years, supposedly, that it expands and adds DNA until it becomes this complex individual full of billions of cells has never been observed are proven, because it can't happen. But where I was getting at this is, is we can leave that alone all day long, and it's not going to happen unless somebody affects change on it or somebody puts it in order. The universe is too fine-tuned to simply leave it up to chance. But each worldview has to account for that question, how did it get there? Also, it's also in creation that we, read the, we find the answer to the second question. What is the meaning of life, or what is the purpose? Now, granted, we have to go to the end of the Bible to find it, or at least an example of it. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, in Revelation 4 and 11, This is the uh, scene in heaven that, uh, that John is receiving here, and it's the 24 elders, and they're falling down before God, and they're singing. In verse 11, we see one of the verses they are singing. They say, Worthy are you, o our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. The creation was made for the glory of God. And some may reject it as, as life's meaning or the purpose of all this creation, but that is what the biblical record tells us, and it provides an answer. Because again, the alternative is nihilism. Life has no meaning. We're all an accident. Nothing matters. So what's the point? It's a pretty depressing worldview, if you ask me. It's a very, de very depressing, and it just doesn't give any hope, doesn't give any reason for betterment, doesn't give you any reason for continuing living in life. It was made for God's glory. So God makes the creation. That's what the majority of chapter 1 is dealing with until we get to the end of chapter 1 where we encounter the creation of mankind. And here actually in Genesis, again, we get the beginning of mankind. Chapter 2 goes into more detail about that actual day in which God created man and woman. But in the end of Genesis chapter 1, 
starting in verse 26, we read this. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. There we go. Here we have the introduction, or the laying of the foundation of, of a teaching that is so fundamental to just about every other Bible teaching. Immanuel Dehi, in the image of God. That underlines God's reasoning and his logic behind the prohibitions against murder, against adultery, against so many of the rules and, and precepts he has about how to treat one another goes back to the fact that we are all created in the image of God. And that has profound effects. The sanctity of life is, is wholly rooted in the fact that we're all image bearers of God. No matter if we're three weeks old in the womb, or we're approaching our centennial birthday. Because we are all image bearers, life inherently has immense value. And it begins in Genesis. Not only this, but he created them, not only in his image, which underlines the, the importance of our value, but again, I want to emphasize, he created them. I emphasize this again because in addition, in addition to the attacks from the evolutionary standpoint of macroevolution of molecules to man, there is a false teaching out there, which is theistic evolution, which is the claim that they're trying to reconcile what the secular science is saying and what the Bible is saying, and, and the argument goes that, well, God used evolution to achieve his purposes. There's several problems with that viewpoint. One it contradicts the plain text of Genesis 1 and 2. Can't get around that. Trying to argue that is like trying to get a square peg to fit in a round hole. Can't do it. At least without heavy modification. Secondly, it contradicts the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 19, now Jesus, he's teaching on, on marriage here, and we, we've covered it, we covered this last year, last month. Um, but Matthew chapter 19, in verse 4, is what we're going to be reading. Now, it, it's interesting that the question is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? That's, I want, I'm just going to read that for context. But instead, Jesus appealing to the law of Moses or to some current rabbi, teacher, or what this commentary says, he goes clear back to Genesis. And he quotes from Genesis. He said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man shall leave his, his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but are one flesh. And therefore, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Again, he doesn't go back to Moses. He doesn't go back to some other thing. He goes back to the very beginning and says, Have you not read what was said in Genesis? That on that day when God created them, he created a male and female. He didn't create some sort of weird proto-human that evolved. He created male and female. So it contradicts the words of Jesus, and also it diminishes God's power. Because oftentimes the people who advocate theistic evolution often still hold to the resurrection, the virgin birth, the working of miracles in the New Testament, and so there's an inconsistency. If we're saying that God is all-powerful and can raise people from the dead, can create life from non-life, which is what's happening in the virgin birth, that's a miracle in and of itself. If God can do that, but then you're saying, no, instantaneous or miraculous creation is, no, it's, God can't do that. He chose this process. If God can do this, logically it's not impossible for him to do the other, and so I would rather stick with what the text says than some, somebody's musings of trying to reconcile things that um, can't be reconciled in that aspect. 
The Bible does not teach that man came from the process of macroevolution of, of, of molecules to man. Now, it's interesting that he created man, he created him in the image of God. It's interesting that there's some associated things with that. Uh, the fact that God created also gives us the answer to another one of our questions. How do we account for morality? The fact that a holy, uh, all righteous and holy God made the universe establishes the fact that he is the originator of morality. The fact that we were created in the likeness of him and the image of God indicates too, and, and the way I understand and read this is it's not just, it's more to do with the inner man, his workings, his spirit, his mind, his conscience. And so because we're made in that image of God, inherently within us is this initial sense of right and wrong. That because, and we're going to see in the next point, because of the fallen world, it gets corrupted very quickly and needs retraining again by Scripture. But the root feeling there stays the same. There's a reason why we bicker when a wrong is committed against us. Even the person who does not know God, there's still this longing for justice in the world. Much of the outrage we see in the world today through these social movements, why we may disagree about what they're trying to do or the reason why there's an outrage, what's driving those individuals? They sense a perceived injustice. There's a moral compass there at work that, yes, perhaps corrupted by the world, but that sense of justice is still there. And I would submit to you that that sense of justice is evidence for part of us being made in the image of God. And again, I want to emphasize, because of the fallen world we live in, it gets corrupted very quickly. But going back to this, we have an account for why morality is in, why humans have morality. Now, unfortunately, we don't get too far in the biblical text before sin pops up. So during the Genesis chapter 3, and this is the interesting thing, thing too, again, on the topic of morality, because God set a standard, there was a standard to be violated. There was a law to be broken. Um, of course, in the beginning, it was very simple. Adam and Eve had not yet, had not yet the knowledge of good and evil. Their knowledge at this point was, don't eat from that tree. If you eat from that tree, there's going to be consequences. That was the only rule. So starting, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. We see the lie immediately off the bat. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Here we have the deception. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So the lie is, and how often Satan works, is he takes the kernel of truth and he, he twists it. Because you're not really going to die. I believe Satan knew what God meant when he said you're going to die. He says, you're not really going to have, that's not really going to happen. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. This is what Satan, Satan basically saying to Eve. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The real reason, the real reason why God doesn't want you to eat from that tree, it's not because you're going to die. It's because he's jealous. He doesn't want you to be like him. So again, that, that lie drags him in. Makes it look appetizing. Makes it look like the best thing in the world. And we have the fall, unfortunately. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took it from its fruit and ate. She, also, she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. There's a lot we could talk about right there. But the thing is, they gave in to temptation. From the very beginning, we also learned that temptation hasn't changed. It's like what's said in the general epistles towards the end of your New Testament. 
that man is taken down by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All three of those are right here. She saw it was good for the food, so the lust of the flesh, that was, a, that was a normal desire, hunger, it was delight to the eyes, lust of the eyes, make one wise, pride of life. Satan's tools haven't changed. He doesn't need to change them. They're effective. Then we have to deal with the consequences. In Genesis chapter 3, looking at verse 7 then, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So they had knowledge now. They had knowledge of good and evil. They, they recognized that they were unclothed, and because of that knowledge, they recognized that what, that was not good. At least they perceived it not to be good. Jumping a few verses down. Oh, real quick. We also learn here that man was created as a free moral agent. God, they chose to eat from that tree. No one forced them. No one compelled them. Saint tempted them, but he did not force them. They chose of their own free will. But jumping down now to see the consequences. God's walking in the garden of the cool of the day. He calls from there, hidden themselves. Verse 12, after God says, Have you eaten from the tree which I command you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, from dust you will eat all the days of your life. We're going to be coming back to verse 15 in a moment. Skipping down. We see the consequences for the woman in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply, multiply your, chi- your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then Adam said to him, then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because you were taken. From there you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So the woman is going to have pain being multiplied, and man is going to have to beat his own brow in order to get the ground to produce anything. I'm left to, to believe that in the garden there, there was no real need to have that toll backbreaking work. The trees produced it was an easy labor, if you will. And God's changing that and says, no, no longer. Satan is, the serpent is cursed to crawl in his belly the rest of his life. And then ultimately, the, the big, big consequence, starting in verse 22, the Lord God said, behold, The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand, and he might also take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim with the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. The ultimate consequence... But let's, let's be real honest here. The working of the ground, you can live with that. I'm going to stay silent on the second consequence. Um, I'm not a woman, so I can't relate. But in relatively speaking, those consequences do not compare to being removed from the presence of God. And so actually from the rest, the rest of the biblical story from this point forward is going to deal with the issue of how do we get back into a relationship with God? 
how do we solve this sin problem? And it's going to be a long story. In fact, Genesis 1 through, a, uh, 1 through 11, it's a very quick read. We're given the whole history of world from creation up until we introduce this character named Abram. And then from Abram, he becomes Abraham. We start seeing the storyline of how God is going to choose a people, and through that people, he's going to bring about a Messiah who's going to be able to bring mankind back into a relationship with God, where God can dwell among his people again. And I've always wondered, too, not wondered, I've always thought this, I would not want to have been Adam on the walk out of the garden. I can't imagine that conversation between husband and wife was a pleasant one in the months that followed. Um, And again, the rest of the Bible will be about correcting the sin problem. Now, going back to verse 15, because in Genesis chapter 3, we find the first glimmer of hope for mankind. The the first instance of the gospel. And turning back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, now he's saying this to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall uh, bruise him on the heel. I believe that the text would, that this is the gospel, the first dawning of it. Looking to a coming time which Satan would be dealt a death blow. That's what he... uh, the blow to the head would be considered a death blow. And at most, what Satan's going to be able to do to that Savior is Bruce's heel. I think we see this on the cross. Uh, the world thought that here we have what's done, we're finished with this guy, we've crucified him. But again, we see from Paul's writings in Romans that Christ proved himself to, be, to have proof positive that he was Lord in Christ and the promised Messiah by proof of resurrection. When he was resurrected, he had conquered death and made it possible for man to be reconciled back to God. Satan's domain over mankind was broken on that day. Because so long as Satan had control over death, we were his. And what I I mean by this, again, that law system, no one could be made perfect underneath the law. No amount of law keeping could ever save an individual because that's what was expected of you. And the moment you broke the law, it doesn't matter how many more times you followed it perfectly after that, you still broke the law. And so you were in Satan's domain. You were a sinner. You were removed from God. Jesus changed all that. By initiating that new covenant and having full forgiveness of sins. And having victory over death, as the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, that he tasted death for everybody that he might make us live. That's my paraphrase. That was a death blow to Satan. His power was greatly diminished after that, and we have the first inkling of that here all the way back in Genesis. That hope is starting to dawn. But it would take time. He still had to teach his people of the gravity of sin and the evils of sin, and prepare a people to bring about the Messiah and get the world to understand the seriousness of this situation. So for a period, he set the nation of Israel as a teaching nation, if you will. They were supposed to be, yes, separate and and apart from the world, but that was a testimony to the world for the power of Jehovah. The nation of Israel served as a a pre-shadow or foreshadow of the good things that were going to come. about God's mercy and his righteousness. We're going to be shown through them. In fact, this promise, uh, and not this promise, but uh, turn me to chapter 12 here. After, in fact, this is when we encounter Abraham, or Abram at this point. And we see this this glimmer of hope expand a little bit in God's promise to Abraham. He said, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. 
and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. It took time for him to understand that statement. It took time for the prophets to really have the revelation to understand that statement. But looking in the New Testament now, we see that this passage, this promise, was quoted frequently by the apostles and New Testament preachers about how that promise was one of the cornerstones of the coming gospel. In Acts chapter 3, This is just one instance of this. In Acts chapter 3, we find one of the apostles preaching here, uh, Peter specifically, starting in verse 24, talking about these days of, of, of the gospel that is now being preached there, the reconciliation that's now available in Christ. He said, and likewise, in verse 24, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to his successors onward also announce these days. It is with uh, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to them, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Now he's preaching about Jesus and the forgiveness that's available in Jesus, but he's making reference back to that promise. That dawning of the gospel. Real quickly here, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Um, I want to make some New Testament applications of this and how, how all this creation, all, all these beginnings apply to us in a real practical way today. Uh, I may mention in previous sermons that really we're living still in a pre-Christian society. We're very much in a pre-Christian age. Uh, as I made the point, some have said we've lost Christian America. Well, the thing is, in order for America to, be, to lose it, you first had to be you first had to have it. In order for America to be a post-Christian nation, it first actually had to be a Christian nation. At best, it was Christian-ish. Culturally, we they agreed a lot, but that, that's another lecture uh, for another time. Uh, <laughs> notice in Paul's sermon here on Mars Hill, he is approaching, he is preaching to these Greek philosophers and, and those who are in the area. The Greeks had a much different conception about the universe. Uh, Mary serves me correctly. One school of thought actually was that the universe had always been in existence. It had no beginning. It has no end. It's just there. And then, again, their concept of the gods was much more remote. They were, they were just like they were. They caused mischief. They intervened in people's lives, not for good, not, but just to make trouble and to have their way and, and do what they wanted. And their idea of religion was more of appeasement and tricking the gods to do something for me. And so Paul really can't start at square one with these people. You know, when he came into a synagogue, he could start with the prophets. They had that commonality. There's nothing in common with these two worldviews. So where does he begin? He begins with creation. And again, he points to the altar of the unknown God. And he says, it is this God, in verse uh, 23, at the end of verse, Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. I'm going to pause there. And preaching to these individuals, he goes back to Genesis to establish, or to start building the square, if you will. He goes back to Genesis to show that the God that you're worshiping in ignorance, the God who I serve, is Lord and creator over all. He is supreme. And it's interesting that when you look throughout the New Testament, most of the time when you see authors referring back to Genesis 1, it's to establish this point. God is supreme sovereign. He is supreme creator. He has made everything. And normally it comes with the applications of because he is the maker of everything, he sets the rules. And because he is maker of everything, including you, you are accountable to him. Which Paul will make these points. He also shows them purpose about God's creation. So 
so in verse 27 here, uh, verse 26 for context, after he talks about how God, God is not served by human hands as if he had need of anything, verse 26, it says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek for God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. It gives them purpose. Your purpose is to serve God, to reach for him, to seek out him, to live by his statutes. So he gives them that purpose, and he, and he gives them the destiny, which is that fourth question, where are we heading? He tells them where you're all headed. There's a coming judgment day. And he calls them to repentance because in light of that fact. So here we go from a people that had no concept of Jehovah. And very quickly, Paul goes through creation to establish him Lord over all. Because he is Lord over all, you are accountable to him. So what are you going to do about it, he says, it's in a sense. Sorry, in verse 29. He says, being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men, sorry, to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Creation matters today, and Genesis 1 matters today, because a lot of people we're going to be talking with have no religious background. American Southwest, they have a unique religious background. I'm going to leave it at that. Those of you who have been up to Sedona, you, you've seen the people, right? The ones who go up to a rock and just lean against it all day. That's, that's the religious background we're dealing with down here. That kind of New Age stuff or just complete ignorance. You know, the bright side of the, the increasing biblical ignorance in our country today is most people just don't know. And so, really, you can start with a clean slate with people instead of having to work through all the religious baggage they're carrying around with them. Now, they may have some very wrong ideas about the Bible and what it teaches. Just about anyone you're going to talk to or working with who's not yet a Christian is going to have some of that. But when it comes to dealing with people, a lot of people today, we can't start square one. We have to start building the square with Jehovah God as Lord and Creator. So I'm going to echo what Paul said today. If you're not yet a Christian this morning, you ought to be. I'm going to quote again what Paul said. He, God's over, in times past, he, he's now, there goes my memory. In Acts chapter 17, it says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent. He's recognizing here there perhaps was a time when God was tolerant to people's ignorance. That's no longer. His message has been proclaimed loud and clear. In fact, every time you check the day and time, his message is being declared loud and clear because we reckon time by the man Jesus Christ, give or take four or five years. But if you're not yet a Christian this morning, you know what Jesus did. You know that he died for you so that you might be reconciled to God. You know, reconciled means brought back close, have a relationship with him again. You know all you need to do, all you need to know to make a decision. So if you know what you need to do this morning, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. If you've done that in the past and you've fallen away, you need prayers of strength, you need prayers of restoration, you need sin that needs confessing, please come for us, dare we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>